Kelly, you look amazing. <laughs> you Thank you. Look, fa- uh, uh, dear listener slash viewer, uh, we are about to leave on a date. I'm just telling you how our life works. And we said, hey, let's go upstairs to the studio and let's film an intro outro. And I'm glad we did because I got to capture on camera the beautiful, perfect, (sighs) majestic. Wow. But most people are listening to this. They're not looking at it. But now they get to hear my words and they get to imagine this face. This is very weird. This face. that No. It's like the noonday sun. It's like staring into a quasar. What is that? A bright, just... Okay, move on. What are we... Can uh, we... Can we? Do we have to do that? Welcome to Clearly, everybody. No. We're doing yes, this again. No, we're not. Oh, no, my gosh. We are pressing on. <laughs> no, we're Jimmy, not. Jimmy, Kelly, uh, we are coming close wow. to the end of First Timothy, Kel. We are. And just like we're coming close to the end of your of weird of our intros. Uh, I am not going to allow this anymore. Uh, that's great because we only have a few more episodes <laughs> left, so I can just keep doing this. Uh, we are coming back around uh, to the false teachers. That's right. And they are, uh, we're getting kind of a new angle on their their um, terribleness, right? And uh, kind of how we can identify them, some traits yes. yep, of these teachers, which yes. we should also avoid any semblance of that in ourselves all day so yes. that's what we're in for today so be listening uh, not just for like how to look out for it in your church but how to look out for it in your own mm-hmm. heart i that's think that's right. a good way to approach this text you ready ready let's dig in here we go Tell me what we're doing. Okay, we are Kale getting Bell. into uh, the last chapter in First Timothy. You guys have been with us through this whole book. Um, and we've covered a lot of terrain. <laughs> a lot. I mean, it's it's qu- quite oh, the... Oh, uh, tacky. Quite the book. But anyway, we're getting into the last chapter today. Uh, we're going to tackle just the first half of it, the first 10 verses. Um, yeah, so that's, that's where we're headed today. Uh, do you want to just... Jimmy, you gave me a challenge earlier. Can okay. I give you one? Talk to me. 60 seconds. Can you walk us through 1 Timothy chapter 1 to where we are right oh, now? Oh, grapes. <laughs> You're in seminary. This should be easy. What does that even mean? That sentence <laughs> you love has how no I use meaning. That as an excuse. That's not an, a it, sentence. I use it all the time as a... I may be flunking, by the way. Okay. So ready? No. How, can how can long? we do a timer? No. Here we go. Here we go. Ready? Catch us up. First Timothy, where have we been? Uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to Timothy, my beloved son. Are you going to quote Grace, it? mercy, and peace from God. The F- um, <laughs> to, for Paul is writing to Timothy. Uh, Timothy's in Ephesus. He's a pastor. Paul is uh, primarily addressing Timothy. Uh, the, the, the leading reason is there are false teachers in the church mm-hmm. that are coming up in the ranks, and uh, they're creating some problems. The content of their uh, teaching is not so known in the text, but uh, the mm-hmm. problem is the fruit. Mm-hmm. And this book is really all about fruit. 30 seconds. Hold on, girl. Uh, these false teachers are bringing some bad fruits and bad results mm-hmm. of their teaching, and it's disrupting the church. So he is looking at Timothy, and he's going, hey, let's talk about how to create good fruit in the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the focus is on the church. The focus is uh, right doctrine and how it's supposed to produce godly living. And so we look at everything from lifestyle decisions to church polity and how we interact with one another in the church. We look at church leadership and all of that. Uh, and uh, and then here we are at chapter six, and we're circling back in some ways to the very beginning mm-hmm. of the book because we're back talking about false teachers and those types of things. Was that pretty good? That's pretty good. Yeah, you went a little over your minute. That doesn't sound like me. (laughs) But that was great. Caught us up to where we're at, which uh, we're going to just read the first couple of verses because before we get to that circling back, there's kind of a a side right here that happens at the beginning of chapter six to a particular group of people within the church. Yes. Um, That was a euphemistic way to say that. Yep. Keep going. It's just a t- it's just so it's so touchy. It's a particular group of people. Go ahead, why don't you read it? Let's find out who these particular group of people okay. are. So again, First Timothy chapter six starts this way: Let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. 
Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. So he's talking about bond servants or in the Greek, doulos, right? Yeah. Slaves. Slaves. Um, so, yeah, there's people that one, can I just make a couple observations? We're going to tackle this. Can I say that in the next episode? We're yeah. Gonna, we're just going to take a deep dive into this whole, like, the Bible and its conversation around slavery passages like this. How do we think about that? Yeah. Um, so if you're interested in that <laughs> whole thing, we're going to give a whole episode to it uh, in the next episode. We're so gonna buckle up, that. buttercup. But can I just make a, an observation? Yes. That there are bond servants in the church. So Slaves just, in the church. That, but just yes. that they are they're believers yep. who are then participating in some way yep. within this congregation yep. of the church. And then Paul, I think, honors them by addressing them in this book, that mm-hmm. he would look at them and not see them as less than, but go, I, I want to give you a particular instruction to help you see how the gospel changes and should impact you. Um, so one, I think it's an honor for them to be addressed mm-hmm. specifically. Um, and then... <laughs> It's it's challenging because uh, he says, let all, it's not some, all, um, regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. So he kind of takes their position that they're in, not the people particularly, but this position that they're in and goes, you should show honor to your masters uh, for the sake of Christ. Yep. So he, do- so he doesn't say run away. Right. So there's that. Which is where we'll get into that more but he doesn't say run away he says honor your own master yeah and uh and honor him even more if they're a believer right you think he might say after that hey if they're a believer shake those guys and say hey you're a believer what are you doing owning slaves you Mm -hmm. think he would say that Uh, but he doesn't say that either and then he gives the reason for all that and you read it a second ago what was the reason he says he says that you should serve them all the better since they who those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. Um, but you're talking about before that where he says, yes. so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. That That's right. In both instances, the glory of God is at stake. Um, the teaching that you say you believe in as a Christian who is a bondservant, um, it is made glorious by your behavior in your uh, servitude. To your masters by how you treat them. And uh, that should show up all the more as honor to those who are also brethren. Yeah. And as icky as that may sound to you at first uh, listen, um, it's important. This uh, this is actually a great moment to highlight one of the major themes that has been running through the whole book of 1 Timothy. You know, if you were in the the trees right now, but if you zoom up to the forest and you kind of look at what the whole book of First Timothy is doing, one way to talk about what this whole book is about is the reputation of the gospel mm-hmm. being protected. Right. And uh, at every turn, you're s- seeing that thing happening. Carry yourself in this way so that the gospel will look appealing to a lost world. Mm -hmm. Do this in the church. uh, Submit in these ways to the church. um, Have this type of leadership running the congregation so that the reputation of the gospel maintains its integrity. It looks attractive to a watching Mm -hmm. world. People come into the fold. So um, I I just say that because for me, and this is just great, just Bible study 101 for you guys listening. Um, if you're always in the trees and you never get out to the forest, mm-hmm. uh, it can feel really confusing and mm-hmm. tedious and the, and we're just, you know, um, everything can get so granular. Now we're having little bickering wars about words, which is actually one of the problems here in the text. Right. <laughs> uh, but I just find it so helpful to always zoom back out. Mm-hmm. We do this all the time and go, but what is the whole book trying to get at? Right. What mm-hmm. is the whole book doing? And let me set this one moment. Maybe it's a weird moment. Let me set it in the context mm-hmm. of the bigger thrust of the passage and then yeah. the, the book as a whole. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so it becomes, uh, if nothing else, a touch less weird to hear mm-hmm. this statement to bond servants, to their masters, like, hey, uh, we want you to live in such a way as to not um, have the name of God or our doctrine be spoken against. It starts to make a little bit more sense because mm-hmm. whatever you think about the issue of bond servants and masters, that whole thing, we can know that th- these Christians in the church who, who are 
walking in these rules, mm-hmm. have an obligation just like the rest of us to make to adorn the the gospel of God, mm-hmm. to make it beautiful to a watching world. And there's something beautiful uh, uh, Paul is saying here when um, a person who gets saved and is in that position of bond servant or slave. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't take off running for the hills, doesn't lambast their master, but instead they they walk with a servant-hearted attitude. There's something mm-hmm. attractive to that, Paul, uh, mm-hmm. to the world Paul is saying about that. Right. And then those who follow Christ have a good reputation, and people are like, well, those are the, the that's who you want to be around. There's that's something wanna, different about right. them. That's right. Which I know, I, I, just to make this applicable to us, I know that this is not talking about employers and employees, but it's one of the closest relationships that we have in a modern day to being in a type of authority structure. There's somebody in charge over you, you are under them, you owe them a type of service. Um, And in that context, right, as believers, how should we then act toward our bosses, our earthly bosses, be they believer or unbeliever, right? They should be counted as worthy of all honor. Like We should honor them. We should not be behind our boss's back talking bad about them, even if they might be deserving of that. Um, and then if they we find them to be a believer, mm-hmm. then all the more should we serve them with gladness uh, because they're the ones who are now benefiting are part of the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. We should seek to benefit them all the more. And so I do think there is a real... Um, encouragement for us there for whoever we would say is our boss an earthly boss for in any type of job yeah that's right to work hard for them um to adorn the gospel so that's that's right yep. yeah so he moves on from there and and does circle back to what we saw in the beginning of the letter to address uh, uh some people uh who are not teaching right things um which again is such a huge important part of local church protecting this beautiful thing this the gospel of jesus christ um so let's just read part of it yes do you want to read it i always do the reading because i love reading the bible let me read it but you you're read in the it? esv i'm, we have different I'm in translations, the which was nasb not on purpose but is now teach and preach these principles if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words those of our lord jesus christ and with the doctrine conforming to godliness he is conceited and understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. Hmm. So that's who we're talking about. Hmm. Yeah, so... Charming fellows. Uh, get, a, get a drink with them. <laughs> right. Sweet guys, really. We have this admonition given to anyone who teaches something different. Um, So you see this, something that's different, uh, doesn't agree with the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't accord with godliness, um, a godly lifestyle. Um, Anyone who's veering from that, we have this long descriptive list. And Jimmy, I just came up with kind of a phrase to encapsulate this First, I would say oh, this is a... Oh, you're going all preacher on me. that's why I told you, you'd, you'd be proud it of me. It better have some alliteration in it, mm. or else I'm walking out of here right now. Wow. Go. You should just walk. You have five you seconds. Go walk now. Oh, okay. I'm just kidding. Go. Uh, <laughs> I do have alliteration. Nailed it! <laughs> um, no, this first... I, I'm just going to say this first category of description of people, false teachers, right, who are veering from this doctrine would be mm-hmm. that they have a craving for controversy. That's a C alliteration, kids. <laughs> uh, they and and the ESV translation actually uses that phrase "craving." Yeah, um, that it calls it an unhealthy craving for controversy and quarrels about words. Um, that there is, uh, yeah, a hunger for uh, controversial things, and you see that when you start to veer away from um, this, the doctrine of the gospel. Um, this is one of the things kind of one of the symptoms that starts to show up. Um, Some other descriptions of this is that you just read this, they're conceited, uh, proud, right? Which you think about somebody who's interested in controversy, they usually feel really confident about what they're saying. They're in whatever, whether it's the chat room online or it's just in personal relationships, it's controversy takes a measure of like, confidence Mm -hmm. to engage with. There's Mm -hmm. a type of conceit or pride there, but also it says they understand nothing. It's such an interesting paradox to be puffed up with pride and conceit and yet understand nothing. Mm. And 
they're just interested in the controversy for controversy's sake a little bit. Yeah. Um, they're this quarreling about words. And again, the fruit of all this controversy is a list of five things they give that it's producing envy and dissension, slander, uh, evil suspicion, constant friction. Just there's constant aggravation um, happening. That all of this descriptive language is to help us kind of see there there is a that's a symptom of going astray from uh, right doctrine. Now this that's this good. type of going astray is probably not going astray into non spiritual things. This is probably uh, people teaching religious religious stuff. things, right? Yeah, that would sure. we would probably see in Christian chat rooms nowadays. Or you, you, hold on, we need to back back up. <laughs> To 1997, when we were all in a chat room, so you guys can get some okay. perspective here. What, well, then you make it modern. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Let me get on aim real quick. And, uh, hey, uh, I, I had what my was your aim? Share. What was your aim? You don't even want to know. Can, I really do. Bad. I actually think the world needs to know. Can I tell you mine? <laughs> mine was Kirby Nez. Kirby Nez was my know, AOL nobody aim. Nobody knows what we're talking about. Cur- AOL Instant Messenger. That was my little handle. Yeah. Uh, it was two words put together: Kirby from Kirby's okay, Dreamland, we don't need to the waste big puffy yeah. guy, mm-hmm. and then uh, an Ibanez guitar because that's the guitar I played at the time. Mm-hmm. And I put them together, Kelly, like a brilliant poet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna keep going. So, whatever our modern day version of online controversy is, of which is many <laughs> Twitter, Facebook, what. Fill uh, it in. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, that sounds. You good. don't have anything better. Yeah. <laughs> point is uh seeing all of that it's tempting to get caught up in it i think all of us feel that we feel a type of wanting to defend the truth and wanting to um yeah it's but it's just good to remember there's an endless type of friction happening in some of those spaces that is not a product of godliness or a product of uh agreeing with right doctrine and godliness i think it's a craving a, for controversy yes um I think it's a good check too for, you know, this definitely is talking to like false teachers coming Mm -hmm. in, doing the thing. This is my job is like, I, you know, I am pulling folks away to this whole like new slice of doctrine, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if I think about it in those ways, I'm like, "Ah, I can't relate to that. You know, like this doesn't, you know, who's coming into a church and do, but, um, but I do think it's helpful to think about it um, like, a, a tendency um, we e- even well-meaning Christians can get into. Mm-hmm. I actually feel an impulse to this. Right. You, um, I love like the fringy stuff, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, in a lot of ways, that's what drives us it clearly is to address the difficult or tricky topics. I mean, that's mm-hmm. kind of like right. our whole shtick. I was thinking about myself when I was reading this today, mm-hmm. even going, huh, Lord, is it, I, I want to be checked in that right. too. Um, but I think the difference is... Um, the fruit it's producing and mm-hmm. the aim of the of the one doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, remember, our aim needs to be love from a pure heart. I remember mm-hmm. chapter one, verse five, and a clean conscience and a right. sincere faith. And uh, so the, those have got to be the the aim of the person and mm-hmm. the fruit it's producing. Otherwise, we should really probably get off those hot topics because mm-hmm. it's it's Absolutely. probably not profitable. Right. Even if your whole life is, even if you're not like. I'm putting on my false teacher hat, you right. know, just chasing weird stuff is maybe not always great. Mm-hmm. But there, yeah, there's the, the motivation behind it matters. And the motivation, obviously, for these people is to pull people away from uh, good doctrine and sound words. And you see them in, uh, I think you read through verse five, right? Yeah. There's another, uh, dis- another symptom, uh, descriptive uh, kind of description here happening of these false teachers. So why don't you read 6 through 10? So he said, uh, these people suppose that godliness is a means of gain, but Mm -hmm. godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment, he says. Verse 7, for we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and into a snare and many foolish and harmful desires, which Plunge men into ruin and destruction, for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. Hmm. 
So do you want to hear my next phrase? It better have some, if you could do like alliteration with X's, nobody's doing <laughs> that out there. So. No, sorry, I can't do that. Z- xylophones and <laughs> so, I got nothing. Uh, these false teachers have a craving for controversy, but they also have a craving for cash. Oh, come on. Now we have four C's. I know. Isn't it wonderful? Mm. I knew you'd appreciate that. Um, earlier today, I was like, Jimmy, you're going to love my, my walk through this. Second. A craving for cash. A craving for cash. Um, they, it says in verse five, what we read before, that they are imagining that godliness is a means of gain, uh, that I can use there's a, I'm going to look to godliness, kind of the fruits of Christianity in a lifestyle to produce a type of gain for me. Um, and Paul, of course, comes back and says, no, it's godliness with contentment that is the gain, uh, which he defines the contentment with the basics of if we have food and clothing, done, we're good. <laughs> that's, that's kind of his standard. Do you have food to eat today? Are you wearing clothes? <laughs> then you're good. You don't need anything else. You came nothing, eat nothing. You brought nothing to the world. You're going to take nothing with you. You can't actually gain anything from this life. So if you're clothed today and you're fed today, you're good. You, your godliness should make you feel so content with any circumstance you're in. So long as you have food and clothes, you should have a sense of contentment, <laughs> which is already, gosh, what a rebuke to our modern right uh, senses. We yeah. all tend to want more. But uh, these people who are straying away from the gospel... Um, it is producing a longing for that godliness to produce a type of gain. And we see him say that there's a desire to be rich. Yeah. Not rich. So just to clarify, Paul doesn't have a particular problem with the fact that you might Wealth be rich. Itself. Because later in this same chapter, we're going to get to it eventually, um, he will address the rich, the rich in this present age. And he, and he doesn't... Uh, condemn them for the fact that they have wealth. Mm -hmm. So it's not that if you have wealth and you happen to have a lot of money that all of a sudden that's a problem. He here says it's not that you are wealthy, it's the desire to be wealthy, that you would look at wealth and say, I want that, that he then, just listen to the language around desiring wealth. This to me is such a countercultural thing in America because we are trained from childhood to desire wealth, (sighs) right? What will earn you the most money? Go do that uh, track in yeah. college, right? That's what we're trained to do. But he says, here's what I want you to associate with desires for wealth. He calls it a temptation, snare, mm. harmful, harmful desires. It plunges you into ruin and destruction. He calls it all kind, it's the root of all kinds of evil. Um, he talks about wandering away from the faith, which what could be more detrimental than that? Piercing yourself. Mm. The imagery is so graphic. Piercing yourself with many pangs. I mean, there's just, I read that and I was like, Lord, please would you remind me that that's true? Because sometimes all I think is, gosh, could we just have, it doesn't, who doesn't think, gosh, could we just have more money? The car <laughs> needs to be fixed. You know, this thing in the house is breaking. And it usually feels like really noble things, right? That we have reasons for that. Um, but he says the desire to be rich comes with a lot of, dangers, a lot of negative things, the desire for it. Yeah. But this is something that's marking people who are straying away um, from the gospel. So just, there's a craving for controversy, a craving for cash. And what I think is, uh, just to, if we can go back to the standard here, uh, what was happening in the beginning? He said, Timothy, teach and, and urge these things, um, which we're talking about all these things he's been saying Uh, through the book, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus came, right, to save sinners. Paul says, among whom I'm foremost, that that gospel truth should produce a godly lifestyle of good works and and kind of a a, a quiet, godly life. Um, And what he is advocating for is agreement with that and contentment. (laughs) It's total opposite. Craving for controversy, dissension, I want to argue. He's calling Mm. for agreement, someone who doesn't agree with the sound words, that's marking a false teacher. But for the Christian, we're called to agree, uh, to have a sense of, yes, I am for this. We're mm-hmm. called to be marked by what we're for, and we're called to be marked by our contentment. Mm-hmm. Whereas these false teachers are marked by what they're against and for what they long for, a well, lack of satisfaction. And I think, you know, just reflecting on the wealth thing and the desire for it, um, it it's... Uh, it's interesting. Paul 
Paul never really gives the uh, he he never gives the reason why or in what way it's a means of great gain when it's accompanied by contentment. Uh, he just says uh, godliness actually is a means of great gain when co- when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. And mm-hmm. I was kind of expecting him to say something like. But we have, you know, everything in Christ. But I think that that's kind of implied here because he's he's he says, hey, godliness actually is in some ways. There's a way to talk about which is it's it's the greatest form of gain. Right. Uh, but it's not f- it's a gain for later. Not it's for a, this life. Yes, it's a right. it's a gain that isn't realized in its fullness mm-hmm. now. And so right. I think for. For anybody who's tempted um, with stuff around love of money and that sort mm-hmm. of thing, I think the the solution, the implicit solution here is, hey, you got to get your eyes off of now. Right. You have to be looking f- forward. You know, in a lot of ways, uh, I've heard uh, folks like uh, Piper talk about the one of the problems with the prosperity gospel, for instance, mm-hmm. is not necessarily. Um, the teaching that God intends to make you healthy, wealthy, and bless you, but that it's um, it's putting what is meant for the future in your present. That's it's right. he calls it over realized eschatology, and I think that's a really helpful way to talk to, talk about it. God is is going to explode uh, blessing onto that's our right. life. Um, and in ways we can't even dream one day, mm-hmm. uh, but if we're thinking about it with our now hats on, right. uh, we are going to be disappointed. We're going to be chasing something that Proverbs is going to tell us. It sprouts wings and it flies away. Mm-hmm. So don't look for it here. Where, where right. your treasure is, there your heart will be. So put your heart, put put your treasure in heaven. Your heart's going to mm-hmm. go there, right. and uh, and that's where it needs to be anyways. Well, and that's where he's going to go later with the rich, uh, that he will call them rich in this present age to yeah. emphasize the present nature of riches. He will call them uncertain riches, and then he will tell them to store up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. That Later in the same chapter, right. he's going to do all of that with wealth um, and set their focus on eternity. And then the rest, and just uh, for the rest of us to just go, be content. Yeah. Food and clothes, it's enough. You were born with nothing. You'll take nothing with you. There's nothing like that, nothing, uh, no wealth that you can gain in this life that actually profits you um, in the truest sense. But godliness will because you're setting your hope on a future treasure. And it's a good word for us. Yep. Yes, it is. Dear listener, thanks for tuning in today. I, in between takes, uh, had to hear my wife tell me how much she hated that intro. And that's why I am going Uh, to say the opposite of what we said at the beginning. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Kelly, your face is the worst. It's malformed. It's splotchy. Your teeth look like hewn lambs <laughs> and all, half of them are missing it's uh <sighs> is this making i just need to know is this making you is this undoing the, the no thing that, it's making it worse okay let's just not focus on me at all that would be so nice i hope you enjoyed the episode everyone <laughs> uh feel free to rate like <laughs> subscribe share with a friend tweet it out yes bleed it out please don't do that But uh, we're in for just an interesting conversation next time. So we hope you'll join us here uh, on our next episode for something that I think we all care about, knowing what the Bible says, but it's, it's tricky. It is. It is. We're getting into we're the, the topic of, uh, of slavery and how the mm-hmm. Bible handles it and if we're seeing it right or wrong and mm-hmm. what does it mean for us and should we be embarrassed about what the text says. All of that's coming up next time, so be sure to tune in. All right. Bye.